Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, today we continue talking about um, damping of oscillations uh, in case these oscillations occur in viscosity uh, environment. So viscosity uh, is an important factor which damps the oscillations. Now the previous lecture was also about viscosity um, but in that case we were talking about so-called overdamping when viscosity is so high that the object after we stretch the spring uh, and let it go it will start moving towards the neutral position but it will never reach it and never cross it obviously so there is no oscillation it will just slow down slower and slower and it will be slower and slower moving towards the neutral position never reaching it well in this ideal obviously uh, situation this is our model obviously okay now let me just remind you that the main differential equation which we were dealing with was which describes basically the movement of uh, the object in the viscosity environment was as follows mx plus cx plus kx t is equal to zero. Now, why is that? Well, because uh, the spring is exerting certain uh, force which is described by the Hooke's law which is minus k x of t where x is displacement from the neutral position that's the Hooke's law then we have the viscosity of the environment and we were talking that in our model in our ideal situation the viscosity force is always proportional to the speed where c is some kind of a coefficient of proportionality and the speed is the first derivative of displacement with a minus sign because it's always against the speed speed goes this way the force which resists the viscosity goes the opposite way. And the sum of these two forces is the total force which is acting on the object and it's supposed to obey the second Newton's law. So Fs plus Fv, the spring force plus viscosity force should be equal to the total force which is M times acceleration that's the second law of, the, of Newton and from this you you get this this is minus uh, kx this is minus c and if it's equal to mx uh, second derivative you will transfer everything to one side and that's how you will get this equation now this equation <coughs> needs to be solved and since it's a differential equation of the second order uh, we must have two initial conditions and because it's a linear equation I did explain it in the previous lecture it's sufficient to find two partial solutions two concrete functions which satisfy this let's say x1 of t and x2 of t so let's say we found these two solutions then any linear combination of those guys where a and b are any real constants well actually even complex constants would satisfy this equation and this will describe a general solution so because it's a second degree because it's a second derivative we need two functions and two initial conditions and linear combination of these two partial uh, solutions will give the general solution so how, we did, how did we do it in the previous lecture 
we just tried to find these two solutions using a substitution e to the gamma t. Because if we will do that, we will have the first derivative equals to gamma e to the gamma t. The second derivative would be equal to gamma square e to the gamma t. <coughs> this equation would look like m gamma square e to the gamma t plus c gamma e to the gamma t plus k e to the gamma t equals to zero. e to the gamma t never equals to zero, it's an exponent, so we will have a quadratic equation. We just cancel e to the power of gamma t and we will have a quadratic equation. And quadratic equation has two roots, two solutions gamma 1 and 2, which is 2m minus c plus minus square root c square root minus m k. So these are two solutions of the quadratic equation. So 1 would be gamma 1, and my x1 would be e to the gamma 1t and the second one would be e to the gamma 2t. So it's two different functions, nonlinearly dependent on each other. So this would describe where gamma 1 and gamma t are these. Now, in the previous lecture, we used only the case when c squared minus 4mk is greater than 0. It's very, very important, because in this case we have two different values. And these two values are real. So we have two different real values, and two and gamma 1 and gamma 2, they are different, if this is positive under the radical. And that's why we have two linearly independent solutions, and that's how we, ha we get a general solution. Then, to describe, to find A and B, we used the initial conditions. Well, let's just have initial conditions in this case the initial stretch at moment t is equal to 0 would be a and no initial speed. These are our initial conditions. It can be different, but let's just say that these are initial conditions. From these two initial conditions and having a general uh, expression of the solution to differential equation, we can find a and b to independent variables, two conditions, so we have two linear um, uh, equations with two different variables, very easily to find, that's what we did last time. Today, we will have a different case. Why is it completely different case? Well, because if this is equal to zero, it means I have only one root. Gamma 1 is equal to minus c over 2n. And that's it. Two solutions basically coincide. But I need two functions, two independent, two linearly independent functions. And I have only one. So where can I find the second one? to basically come up with a general solution. So that's why this is a completely separate case, and that's why I have devoted a completely separate lecture about this. So we need something new, a new ingenious guess. But whenever I was trying to find a solution in the form of e to the gamma t, uh, that was kind of an intelligent guess, let's, say. let's put it this way. I mean, it's not my guess, obviously. Somebody else guessed it for me that these types of equations are very easy to solve with this exponential function. So I will try to do something similar, but again, it's not mine. <laughs> Somebody else was smarter than me and many, many years ago uh, came up with a way how to uh, find another uh, solution to another partial, sp uh, partial solution to this particular equation using some other function, not this type of function, but a different function. And that's exactly what I will just present to you. And you will see how we can find another function, which will, together with this one, 
uh, delivered. So I don't have it this way. This is not. So another function which we will use will be the following. And I will try to find another partial solution in this form, t times e to the gamma t. It's very close to this one, I just multiplied by t. Now, well, let's see what happens. How to find such a gamma that this would satisfy this equation. Well, let's see. First derivative is equal to, now this is a multiplication of two functions. So the derivative of two functions, well, if you remember, u times v derivative is equal to u v derivative plus u derivative v. I mean, you have to remember this formula from the uh, calculus. So u is, is a t and v is e to the gamma t. So uh, derivative of the first function times the second derivative of t is 1, so it's e to the gamma t plus the first without any change by derivative of e to the gamma t, so it's t times gamma times e to the gamma t. That's my first derivative. My second derivative is derivative of this function. This is a sum, so a derivative of the sum is sum of derivatives. So the derivative of this is gamma e to the gamma t. The derivative of this is, uh, well, gamma is just a multiplier, right? So it's t times gamma times the derivative of this, which is gamma square e to the gamma t, plus uh, derivative of this function times this. So it's uh, gamma e to the gamma t. So that's my second derivative. Now, let's substitute it into this equation. So what happens? m times this, well, by the way, this and this, I can just combine together into 2 gamma e to the power of whatever. OK, so m times this, m times 2 gamma e to the power of gamma t plus t gamma square e to the gamma t plus c to the first derivative. First derivative of this, so it's c e to the power of gamma t plus t gamma e to the power of gamma t plus kx plus k and x is this, t e to the power of gamma t. Now this is supposed to be equal to zero for any t. So we have to find such a gamma where this thing is supposed to be equal to zero identically for any t. That means it's a solution, right? Well, OK, so let's just summarize all things which are related to t and then all the free stuff. So with t, what do I have with t? I have m. Well, by the way, I immediately cancel this. It's not equal to 0, so I divide everything by 0, so it's not dependent on e to the power of gamma t. So what do I have with t? I have m gamma square. I have C gamma. And I have K. OK? Now, what do, I, what do I have as a free member? I have 2m gamma and I have c times 1 plus c. Now, it's supposed to be equal to 0 identically. 
which means this is supposed to be equal to zero and this is supposed to be equal to zero okay so we have to find gamma such that that is equal to zero and this is equal to zero well let's see if it exists for this to be equal to zero I have to choose gamma equals minus c divided by 2m right if gamma is equal to minus c divided by 2m this would be zero now what happens with this if this is true well I will have m times gamma square which is c squared divided by 4m squared plus c times gamma which means minus c squared divided by 2m right that's what if, if gamma is this multiplied by c I will have this one plus k now speaking about k let me remind you that we are talking about this particular discriminant which is c squared minus 4 m k equals to zero this is only the case we are talking about this is why we are actually going into all these troubles because our quadratic equation the first quadratic e the first method of finding the solution uh, using quadrat quadratic equation gave only one root instead of two so if this discriminant is equal to zero I have only one solution to m gamma square plus c gamma plus k is equal to zero now from this follows that k is equal to c squared divided by 4m so in this plus k I will ha just have plus c squared divided by 4m <coughs> so what happens here this uh, reduces this so I have c squared divided by 4m and another c squared divided by 4m so it's a c squared divided by 2m and minus c squared divided by 2m so in this case my this part is also equal to zero the same thing as this one so this under these circumstances whenever I have this kind of a relationship between um, viscosity, mass and elasticity of the spring if these are in this particular condition then this gamma delivers me a solution which looks like this function where gamma is this so I have a second solution only if our um, the whole our system which can which consists of spring which has elasticity an object mass and uh, viscosity of uh, of the environment only in this particular condition when they are in this relationship I have troubles looking for solutions during uh, using the first methodology and that's why I have invented the second methodology which function which is proposed solution looks like this and I did indeed find it if gamma is equal to minus c over 2m so now I have two solutions So the first solution was I was trying to find in this way and I did find that m gamma square plus c uh, gamma plus k is equal to zero would be uh, an equation and gamma would be equal to minus c divided by 2m right because the square root of something is equal to zero in this case now 
let's put it as a gamma 1. Now, another way of finding the function, I proposed this. And I found that gamma 2 in this equal to equal to minus c to n. Same thing as this one, by the way. So let's just forget about gamma 1 and gamma 2. It's still the same gamma. But we have two different functions. This is x1 and this is x2. So, my general solution looks like a times x1, which is e to the power of minus c divided by 2m t, plus b, second function, which is t times e to the power, same thing, the same uh, exponent. Or, if you wish, a plus bt times e to the power minus c over 2m t. So this is a general solution which I can find a and b using my initial conditions um, on our system. Okay, so if I will substitute 0, this will go down this will be 1, so we have only a. So, in this case, a is equal to lowercase a. <coughs> now, what's the derivative of this at 0, and we will find b, right? So, derivative of this is equal to um, x derivative is equal to the first function times uh, the derivative of the second, which is a plus bt times derivative of this, which is minus c over 2m e to the power minus c over 2m t plus derivative of this function times that. The derivative of this function is b. So it's b times e to the power minus c over 2m t. So that's my derivative. Now, at t is equal to 0, it's supposed to be equal to 0, right? So um, the exponent goes to 1, so it doesn't really matter what it is. This disappears. a is equal to lowercase a. That's a given one, right? Okay, so we can just wipe out this thing. I don't need this equation anymore. So I have x of 0 is equal to a plus bt. So a is lowercase a. So it's a. This is 0 times this minus c to m times 1 plus b times 1 and it's supposed to be equal to 0 from which b is equal to minus a I mean plus a times c divided by 2 <coughs> so our general solution is uh, a is equal to lowercase a, its initial stretch. equal to a c over 2 m e is c and 
okay or equals to a times 1 plus c over 2m e to the power minus c to mt <coughs> okay so this is a solution to our um, differential equation with our um, initial conditions <coughs> now how does it look oh I'm sorry I think I have to put t here yeah how does it look well this is a linear function this is exponential function which goes to zero well exponentially goes to zero this is linearly increasing one plus something it's like with this and this is decreasing to zero very fast so what is their product well obviously exponential function goes to zero much faster than this function is growing so the result would be this is this curve has a horizontal tangential line because at zero we have uh, um, first derivative is equal to zero so we will have it horizontally so it's like it, it starts maybe like very uh, like sinusoid more or less so it goes this way and then it very very fast goes to zero and that's is and that is a graph of displacement from the initial position this is a right this is a so initially we stretched by a and then it goes down all the way this way <coughs> actually it's very close to um, the graph which you would receive in a similar with, with similar initial conditions the same a let's say in case of overdamping, whatever we were talking before because in this case as we see we never reach zero we never reach the neutral position it goes closer and closer to the neutral position and, and speed would be less and less because the, um, the the tangential line would be more and more horizontal here that's the speed um, so what's the difference between over damping and this case and this case by the way is called critical damping well in, in for for the same A uh, and, and the same spring, uh, so initial um, stretch is the same and the spring is the same, which means K is the same and mass is the same. So what's the difference actually, remember? C squared minus 4MK. This is discriminant of the original differential equation. So if this is the same mass and this is the same spring, it all depends on this. If this um, viscosity is significantly greater than uh, mass and uh, and the strength of the spring well it means it will be slower whenever it's equal to zero that's basically as fast as we can get without crossing the um, neutral position without real oscillations so the critical uh, damping also produces no oscillations but this is as fast as we can go without crossing that's why it's called critical so in case of um, critical oscillations damping is the fastest among non oscillating systems so the smaller the C the closer this thing is to zero and that's why the faster it will be reaching the neighborhood of the uh, neutral position but still it will not cross it so if you want the fastest way of um, damping the oscillation which means w without without real oscillation if you if you if it if you would like to bring the uh, object as close to neutral position as possible without really oscillating then you have to really choose the 
uh, viscosity of the surrounding um, environment in such a way that it's equal to m times k. Now, why is it proportional to m? I mean, obviously it's proportional to k because the stronger the uh, spring, uh, the more viscosity we need to prevent the bouncing, the, oscill the real oscillation, right? Why m is important? Well, let's put it this way. Consider you have two different balls, uh, a heavy one and a light one. And then you drop both of them into water. Which one would go to the bottom first? Well, the heavier one, right? Because it's really kind of difficult for viscosity to stop the movement of more massive. So it's, if it already has certain speed, uh, it, it will maintain this. To reduce the speed of the massive object is more difficult for viscosous environment than to reduce the speed of the light object. So that's why it's proportional to m, basically. So it has more inertia. So if it has certain speed, to slow it down by viscosity is more difficult. So you need more viscosity. So that's why it's proportional to both. So uh, if our task, our engineering task, to damp my... Us for, for instance, the car jumped uh, over some kind of a bump. You don't want the car to be bouncing back and forth, right? You want it to bring basically to the neutral position all these springs which are inside. So uh, you have to bring it into neutral position uh, as, as fast as possible, right? Um, so that's why you have to, you know, think about uh, whatever the dampers are used inside the, the car to, to be as close to this equal to zero as possible. So, um, now, in the notes for this lecture, I'm using a concrete example with concrete numbers and exact graph, how it looks. Um, I don't remember all these numbers, and basically I'm referring you to, um, to notes for this lecture. Uh, it, it, it's always very useful to go to the notes of the lecture to find exactly um, what, what, what's there. Maybe I'm missing something. I don't think I missed something in this case, but maybe I have something I interesting in the notes as well. Uh, but in particular, I do have a concrete example with concrete numbers. What's m, what's k, what's c, and I draw a, um, a graph and present it uh, in the notes for this lecture. Um, well, basically, that's it. I refer you to unizor.com site um, because it has basically the whole course of physics for teens and also it has a prerequisite course which is called math for teens so it's very useful to refresh your math knowledge especially calculus in this case like i'm operating with derivatives and uh, differential equations so you need all these apparatus to be um, at your hands without any problems that's it thank you very much and good luck